The Sabastopol shipyard attacks were a shaping operation, and here is why this is important. Now, before I get started, as you can see, I'm wearing my Rock Out with your Chalk Out t-shirt. You can get that at Bunker Branding, and my Air Assault video will be out any day now. But right now, I'm talking about Sabastopol. It's the largest city in Crimea and the home of Russia's Black Sea Fleet. It's an extremely important base because it has dry dock and repair facilities. Ukraine attacked this base on Wednesday, September 13th and destroyed a Rapucha class amphibious transport ship and a Kilo class submarine. Now, while destroying the submarine is kind of an interesting feat for a nation with no navy, the amphibious transport ship is actually way more important. First, some background. Crimea is a peninsula in the Black Sea, and it's been strategically important since the 1700s, and arguably even before that. As of right now, there are six ways to get supplies into Crimea. Rail from Melodopol, a highway from Mariupol, road and rail over the Kerch Strait Bridge, although that is in degraded condition, uh, by ship and by air. Now, it should be noted that air resupply is incredibly expensive and you can't bring as much stuff. Air resupply is also very maintenance intensive. The U.S. operated uh, C-17s basically nonstop during the U.S. Evacu uh, evacuation from Afghanistan, running up to like 113 sorties per day for two weeks straight. And afterwards, we had to ground like half of the C-17 fleet so the crew could rest and airframes could be repaired. No nation, not even the U.S., can maintain that kind of op tempo or operational tempo, literally the speed and frequency of operations indefinitely. So air resupply is really tough to do. Right now, Ukraine is aiming to cut off Crimea by land. This is taking a while. But if they can cut the rail line from a lot of pole, and they can somehow drop the Kerch Strait Bridge, then really the only way to resupply Crimea will be by sea or by air, because anything traveling in that little sliver over land will be subject to artillery strikes. So the ultimate goal here is to cut off Crimea. Now, a little bit about this Sevastopol naval base. When the Soviet Union broke up in 1991, the new country of Ukraine inherited Crimea and with it all the, the naval base at Stavistopol, which Russia then leased. Think of it like how the U.S. actually leases Guantanamo Bay from the Cubans. And we really do give the Cubans a check for like $4,000 every year. Although from what I understand, Cuba, uh, Cuba doesn't actually cash the rent checks. Anyway, Russia illegally annexed Crimea in 2014, and they took the whole base over. Now, the Sevastopol naval base is about 183 miles from Odessa, and it's in a really weird location to be attacked from Ukraine. It's slightly too far from unoccupied Ukraine to be attacked directly by aircraft with bombs. It's a little too well defended to be easily attacked by missiles, and attacks will probably come over the sea since maneuvering over land will take time and fuel. Also note, Ukraine doesn't have any mid-air refueling assets. And the only plane that could really make it out there with any kind of ordnance would be their Su-24. And also note, for every extra pound of fuel you carry, you can carry fewer bombs. So attacking that naval base is extremely difficult without standoff ordnance. And I'm going to get to that standoff ordinance in a second. Now, reportedly, Ukraine attacked the Sevastopol shipyards with 10 Storm Shadow missiles, most likely launched from those C-24s, since it's the only aircraft that has hard points that are strong enough to carry these heavy missiles. Russia claims that it shot down seven of those 10 missiles. Now, 70% is a reasonable hit probability for a surface-to-air missile system against a cruise missile threat. No matter how good you are in the defense, something is going to get through. In this case, supposedly three missiles got through. It was enough that a, uh, the Rostovan Don, which is a Kilo-class submarine, and the Rapucha-class land and ship Minsk were damaged, and they were probably damaged beyond repair. So they were probably essentially destroyed. Here's why this is important. 
If you need one Navy ship, you actually need three. And that's because you typically have one ship out on patrol. You have one ship doing training and workups, ready to go out on deployment and testing the equipment that they got onto that ship when they were going through maintenance. And then you have one ship undergoing overhaul and maintenance. So you have this rotation of ships that are constantly going out, constantly training, and constantly being maintained. I'll give you a good example. The U.S. has 11 aircraft carriers. But at any given time, only like four are actually deployed. And in an emergency situation such as a war, we might be able to surge these aircraft carriers to five or six. Can't really do much about the ships that are in the shipyard getting maintenance. Now, I'm going to play a clip from the Joe Rogan podcast where film director Peter Berg speaks about nuclear submarines with the kind of confidence and authority that only people who have no idea what they're talking about can have. But I was thinking, like, what would happen if you took two of these subs and took them offline and built, I don't know, schools? Well, I'll tell you what would happen. The other submarines would have to take up the slack for those two subs. That means more complex maintenance, less time for crew with their families, more time out at sea, and actually lower readiness. So. What Ukraine did in taking out this Rapucha-class amphibious transport ship was to shape the battlefield. And Ukraine it has been amazing at this. Shaping the battlefield or shaping operations involves setting up the conditions for victory. For example, in 1991, after Saddam Hussein invaded Kuwait, coalition air power pounded Hussein's army for like six weeks before ground troops went in. That was a shaping operation. This shaping operation is designed to degrade Russia's amphibious transport capabilities for when Ukraine finally destroys the Kerch Strait Bridge. Russia doesn't have a lot of Rapucha roll-on, roll-off amphibious transport ships in the Black Sea. Uh, now these Actually, they don't have a lot of roll-on, roll-off transport ships in general. These ships are, are fairly rare to begin with. And, Roll on, roll off means that these ships can carry troops, equipment, supplies, and vehicles. And these vehicles can just drive right out without having to unload with a crane. As of right now in the Black Sea, they've only got two Rapucha amphibious transport ships remaining. The Azov and the Yal. Now, with Turkey closing the Bosphorus and Dardanelles Straits to warships, there's no way of getting new roll-on, roll-off ships into the Black Sea with just the ships they already have. So this will stress the two remaining ships. Now, Russia could use civilian ferries around the Kerch Strait for resupply, but that could be problematic. Uh, can you imagine telling a guy who runs a Staten Island ferry that they're going to be taking troops into a combat zone? Yeah, buddy, uh, you're going to have to talk to my shop steward. I ain't doing that. <laughs> so... Once those ferries start carrying military cargo, then they, are, they will be subject to attack by Ukraine, either by missile or by drone ship. So I can envision a lot of crews calling out sick. Now, I'm sure the Russian Navy will just lease those ships from the shipping company. They'll staff it with Navy sailors, and they'll figure out how to work the ship. I'm sure there's a manual somewhere, but that takes time. So remember how I always say to create dilemmas, not problems for your adversary? Um, a problem has one solution, a dilemma has two or more solutions, all of which are equally bad. Well, Ukraine is shaping that battlefield to create a dilemma for Russia. And that is how to resupply Crimea, either by air or by sea, when doing so has extreme disadvantages. And that's the main purpose of the shaping operation, to set up the conditions for victory. Hey, you like the shirt? Like I said, head on over to Bunker Branding. You can also support the channel by going over to Substack, getting a Substack membership for five bucks, or a cameo greeting for someone in your life who loves the channel. Thank you guys so much for watching. Oh, hi, America. It's me, Elon. Uh, if you want to be cool like me, go and get a Ryan McBeth t-shirt or hoodie from Bunker Branding. Mm -hmm. I'm going to get a high mile shirt because it fires rockets, and rockets are pretty cool, just like me. Ha ha ha, ha you fool. It is me, Mark Zuckerberg, from Facebook. And I will be the coolest once I get a Patriot shirt because the system is fully automated, just like me. <laughs> I'm going to get a U.S. Navy Department of the Boat People hoodie because I love their management style. Now, I will be cooler than any of your lads 
Once I get to my drone, sweet drone shot. No, I'm gonna get a landmine marker shirt because they blow up just like windows. Well, I'll tell you what I'm gonna get. Oh no, it is Steve Wozniak from uh, Apple. That's right, you nerds. You think you're the coolest for wearing a shirt? Well, Ryan Macbeth is all the work, yeah. So go buy a shirt from Bunker Branding to fund Ryan Macbeth to increase your understanding. Oh yeah!